we're ready to get started once again. Uh, one quick announcement before the next session is that without reservation, I can recommend downloading the PitchBook app, which is our conference app. It provides information on the program, the delegates that are here today, some that you may care to meet and sit with at lunch or meet at the reception. Um, in addition, it provides M&A financing and corporate profile information for um, both public and private companies. It's a, a very powerful and very impressive uh, application in the conference app you'll have access to uh, on a complimentary basis for being here as our guest. So uh, I can certainly recommend downloading that um, at your leisure. So <laughs> next session is uh, ready to get underway. So navigating both regulatory and antitrust risks. And this will be an interesting session, both in terms of the pre-deal strategy and planning, which will obviously draw on the elements of the first two sessions, and then right through to post uh, acquisition issues and considerations and this certainly this hits home in the spirit of what we're trying to do is better smarter methods and processes for mergers and acquisitions and so this is certainly a key consideration for companies really at all all levels so uh, let me introduce our panelists um, so let me start on this side because Josh is closest so Josh I was interested to have here because he's with Airbus's Silicon Valley outpost. So Airbus, as you may know, is an enormous aerospace and defense company, a diversified industrial business that does a lot of very impressive high-tech work. Um, and Josh is leading as a general counsel the effort in the Silicon Valley area uh, under what is very coolly called A3, or <laughs> Airbus Ventures. And so um, a very impressive pedigree, which you can read in the book, but um, chartered with a very interesting task here of doing deals um, in the Silicon Valley area for a, a traditional aerospace and defense company. So um, now Steve Reeder is the antitrust counsel, quite appropriately uh, invited to this session at Oracle, um, a company that I've always loved as partly as a, a sailor, but as an impressive business that has built a tremendous platform that's always fresh and innovative through acquisitions, through strategic organic development. And so o Oracle's always been a leader that we've looked to and we were really honored that Steve was available to join today. And certainly his work in-house uh, is right on point for this session. He practiced at Skadden and now um, will bring an interesting view to this conversation. So thank you for being here. Um, and last but not least, Jessica Delbaum is a, a partner uh, in the New York office of Sherman & Sterling, a firm that we work ver with very closely uh, and think very highly of. She uh, leads an antitrust work on behalf of her clients and is really an expert in this area. And so she'll both lead this conversation and then as a continuation, not only can you chat with her after, but um, they've put together a pretty impressive work on issues and considerations related to antitrust. And so it, I recommend you take a look at the briefing book that they've shared, um, and certainly it'll be a nice uh, a corollary to this session. So Jessica, with that, let me have you take it away and lead the conversation. Thank, thank you. you. Very, thank you very much and for having us all here. Um, please feel free to interject as we go on. We would, all of us, much prefer this to be an interactive session. We do have, I have slides. We have topics prepared, but we would very much like it just to be a dialogue. And so, you know, project, raise your hand, anything. Um, with that, why care? You know, you're here in the middle of an M&A sessions, lots of interesting things, so why care about antitrust in the middle of this, particularly if you're thinking about a transaction that is not strategic, so one where you're not talking about acquiring or selling to a competitor or in a vertical distributor. Uh, seller, um, supplier, distributor relationship. And you should care because it can impact both your timing of your transaction, even if there are no substantive concerns, uh, and also in between the time between signing and closing, there can be concerns that a government can get interested in. So oftentimes companies think, you know, I'm a US company, I'm not so concerned, I have control over my timing of the filings, and oh, I really only have to deal with the US. There are now over 100 jurisdictions that have some form of antitrust laws. Large number of those have merger control regimes. Um, and some of them can surprise you by what they technically capture. Uh, and it may not just be you know, in a faraway you know, small country. It can be major jurisdictions like Europe or China uh, that have merger control regimes that can capture a wholly US transaction. So you could have, we were talking before, a situation where you've got two large multinational companies that have decided to form a joint venture to develop a line of nursing homes, um, all based in the US. And you could have a company that thinks, well, this is wholly US, it's got no nexus to anywhere else, 
but the way that a number of jurisdictions have structured their merger control laws, um, for example, China and Europe, if the parents have the requisite nexus, having enough turnover in those jurisdictions, you could have a transaction that's reportable in those jurisdictions, even though the actual transaction deals with nursing homes in the US and has no nexus to China. <clears throat> and while you may not have a substantive concern in that situation, it certainly will impact your timing. You might be thinking, well, we could do a sign and close. Not gonna be the case if you have a filing, for example, in China or Europe, and we'll talk a little bit more about that as well. Um, and then if you have actually a substantive transaction where you are in a horizontal or vertical relationship, you not only have to think about the deal certainty um, and potential deal distraction for the signing and closing period, but also about um, whether or not you're actually gonna be able to close the transaction and if you're gonna be able to acquire everything that you want to acquire. And so we'll talk a little bit about some just, you know, rules of thumb to think about both in horizontal and as Steve's gonna talk in particular about some vertical issues that oftentimes people don't think about as readily as when, for example, you've got head-to-head -head competition. So with that, um, unless there are any initial questions, perhaps we can talk a little bit about um, the filing requirements. And so touched a little bit upon the fact that you, know, you may have the transaction that's reportable in a lot of jurisdictions. I know you've had experiences of that. Perhaps you could share a sure, bit. Sure, sure. Um, and I, I could have done this, I guess, at our introduction, so I do have to give my little official disclaimer that I'm here in my personal capacity and uh, any uh, non-controversial opinions <laughs> that I express are, are not the views necessarily of Oracle or, or Larry Ellison, who I'm sure has no idea who I am. And I'm <laughs> So I'll get that out of the way. Um, so uh, Oracle, as you can imagine, um, uh, has a presence around the world. So uh, we're certainly focused on, uh, you know, I, I, I would venture to say the very first question we ask our uh, internal corporate counsel is, do you have international revenue information, international turnover information? Because that's the, that's the preliminary question, right? Where, where are we going to have to file? Um, and the, the implications that that has um, can be really wide ranging. Uh, we were discussing this earlier. Um, you, you generally have a sense of your timing in the US. It's, you know, you, you get your HSR in and that starts a 30 day waiting period. Uh, whether there's, you know, full new file considerations or second request, you know, that can be addressed down the road, but, but you know that much. Um, and uh, in the international setting, there's a lot more wild cards that you have to deal with. Um, Notification's not quite so easy. Um, uh, many European jurisdictions have uh, a, a pre-notification period, basically where you're negotiating to get your filing accepted. Right? You have to build that into timing. Um, so that's, that's a, definitely something to consider. And they can actually toll the waiting period, right? If they decide they have some other question that pops into their head as you know, the Cypriot authorities laying on a beach in Cyprus. And, you know, <laughs> I, I had an initial waiting period in Korea that's 30 days, and 30 days took mm, 120 for that initial waiting period because they kept stopping it. It was the longest 30 days I've ever yeah, had. Yeah, we're just gonna take a break. <laughs> yep, um, they, they issue requests for additional information and they told the waiting period. And so those are definitely things to consider. Um, I, I think uh, one interesting area that's having some movement right now is uh, what triggers a filing. Um, Typically, you look at turnover first. Uh, there's some really uh, current uh, changes happening in Germany right now, where uh, they've uh, basically, with the, with the express aim uh, relevant to, to uh, Silicon Valley, of, of capturing these uh, deals that may register some sort of potential competition down the road. So they've changed. Uh, they're in the process of changing. The law's been passed, and it just needs to be signed by their president now, um, where the trigger is actually the value of the deal. Uh, as opposed to the company's revenues. And that's aimed at catching um, something like an uh, uh, Instagram type of transaction, mm -hmm. something like WhatsApp, where companies' revenues are, are negligible, but uh, you know, what does this actually mean in terms of the, the value of the company and the implications for a competition down the road? So that's kind of their um, express uh, purpose in, in, in changing that law, and I think you're gonna see a lot more uh, filings in Germany, for example. Um, and then I can, you know, I can tell some horror stories. It's not uh, uh, similar to your uh, Korea story. So I started at Oracle uh, about two and a half years ago, of September of 2014. Um, we just purchased Micros, uh, which was one of our, our larger transactions the past five years or so. Um, it's a, it's 
the $7 billion transaction. Uh, there was no horizontal issue there whatsoever. I mean, uh, Micros, uh, if anybody uh, is familiar, does the point of sale system. So it's the little key, that, you know, the little pad that uh, mm -hmm. your waiter um, presses. Um, Oracle was not in that business. Should be no issue. We are still receiving RFIs from the Argentine Competition Authority on that deal. We can post closing filing, but uh, I, I was at our, our antitrust conference in DC and we, we had the, uh, the Argentine Authority, um, which you know they've had political changes in that country, um, and the, their representative there was uh, really happy to say that they were getting their uh, review periods down to about three years. So, <laughs> uh, Luckily not they, suspensory, they, but they, still a hassle. Yeah, yeah, baby steps, baby steps. Yes. Yes, and actually something you mentioned about Germany triggered something um, that may or may not be familiar to this audience, which is in most jurisdictions, um, an authority's ability to investigate is coextensive with whether or not it's reportable, the transaction's reportable. That's certainly the case in Germany and um, at the European Union. It is not in the US, it's not in Canada. Um, so in those jurisdictions, even if a transaction doesn't meet the relevant reporting thresholds, the authorities can, and the US government very much likes to. Um, the uh, bizarre voice is one that comes to mind that where the government, it wasn't reportable because of the oddities of the HSR Act, but yet the government challenged it um, and successfully got a remedy, which also leads nicely into a topic of document creation. Um, because that was a situation where the government relied heavily on what the company's documents said. And, and, and I don't know if that's something you want to touch on as well. Sure. And just to back up a uh, half a second here, uh, an interesting uh, jurisdiction going forward is going to be, I think, the UK as well. Mm -hmm. um, I think there's Brexit implications. Um, many European, of course, there's a, a European Commission um, reviews mergers or can review mergers, but it has a coextensive authority with local jurisdictions as well. So that's definitely something to think about um, in Europe. Um, and now that the UK is exiting the European Union, um, or at least appears set to, um, the, uh, the UK uh, authority, the CMA, um, it could probably look to see that authority be a lot more sort of aggressive and visible. Um, it's a voluntary reporting regime, but- Voluntary is not yeah, always so voluntary. Yeah. <laughs> it's America, sort of in that, that passive aggressive British way, voluntary. Um, <laughs> but, uh, so I just wanted to make yeah. about that. Um, in terms of document creation, I think uh, for a lot of folks in this room, I think that is one of the um, initial easiest ways to minimize your, your antitrust headache. Um, a little background in terms of process, um, you know, any US review begins with an HSR filing, Hart Scott Rubino filing um, to the government, which includes 4C documents, which are I'll abbreviate it, but essentially the documents that are presented to corporate officers and the board um, for the purposes of analyzing the transaction and sort of have some measure of competition in that way. So this is the first primary major thing that anybody, and Jessica can speak to her DOJ experience, is going to look at in the government. Mm -hmm. This can really, this is your first, the journey can, you can determine whether the journey begins a thousand steps or is really just the one step where you submit the filing and your headache goes away. Um, so I, I think you need to be really careful about what goes into those documents and how those documents are shared. I, I think um, I, I'm happy to say that Oracle has a, I, I'd say our best practices are everything that goes to our uh, corporate officers gets rolled up through corp, corp dev. Um, it's very much funneled. Um, our uh, you know, we don't sort of casually pass on whatever's been prepared by a target because sometimes what you see is a mess. Um, and uh, you know, we don't end up buying the company. But um, <laughs> it's, it's, I think to have sort of a, uh, a root and a hierarchy of how those documents get passed on is, is very important. So something, something uh, a little lazy or, or clumsy or sloppy does, doesn't work. Um, and that's just not something you, you pass on. Um, but it's, again, what goes into that document um, it is, is critical. And you'd be amazed at the things that uh, you know, a, a DOJ or, or SEC staffer can latch on to. I mean, we had a, we had a transaction where you know, these documents are a pitch by our corp dev folks mm -hmm. trying to get this deal done. So you know, they're talking up the deal. And you know, 
you know, talking about the importance of this this space, you know, how critical it is. And you know, I think we had to pull and refile because somebody got focused on the word critical. What, what does this mean? Mm -hmm. Is it a critical input? You know, how critical is it to your competitors, which sort of ties into some of the verticals that we've been discussing stuff better. So you, I think you want to be really careful um, about that language. I think that's a, a great time to involve either your, your in-house antitrust counsel if you have it or, or outside counsel to review those documents and anything that's going to be going to your, to your offices. Um, yeah, just keeping them in draft form is important because the, for technical reasons and you only have to submit the final. Oh, I don't know. <laughs> Over here. I hope you, you all heard my genius over the past. Uh, <laughs> they didn't hear anything. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you only submit the latest drafts uh, to the FCC and the DOJ with your initial filing. If you end up in a more in-depth investigation, they will see the prior drafts with one little footnote, which is if anything's presented to the board of directors, even if it's a draft, the, the government does consider that to be final. Um, when you're thinking about selling a company, there's often some tension, and the bankers in particular are trying to maximize the value and the importance of the target. And so you will often see in um, a confidential offering memo or a management presentation a lot of often hyperbole um, and strong language that can be attractive in trying to sell the asset, but can also end up being a headache and causing additional time in a review. And one of the things to think about is if you're thinking your audience is a strategic, they're probably pretty familiar with some of the things, like whether they're high barriers to entry to the area or how strong the uh, target is. And so being careful about your words in the initial documents can be helpful later on in the investigation. Or you may want to prepare two offering memos, one for uh, private equity companies that don't have a portfolio company, so the non-strategics, and then one for the strategics, again, with an eye towards what are you saying and what's going to go to the government later on. Yeah. I mean, just to follow on that point, I can give some some examples. Well, one, I, I want to sort of agree with you that, you know, an acquiring company, they're not going to take your word for it, for one. So, I mean, you can you can sort of boast and puff all you want, but I, I think it's it's better to back those things up. I think there's a sometimes a real um, instinct to sort of denigrate competitors mm -hmm. in these sort of offering documents. I, I don't, it's not necessary. Talk about you and sort of what you do well, I think, um, rather than sort of dive too much into the competitive landscape. Um, and then, yeah, there's just some of these words that and phrases that we were sort of joking, no, no offense to Wharton, I think they must teach in business school, which is, you know, stickiness, barriers to entry, those are just dominant. This is anathema to, to antitrust attorneys. D yeah, do dominant, it's just, I mean, we, we get a little formalistic, but um, the per person reviewing that document is probably going to be pretty formalistic as well, and those words just, just pop out. And staying away even from things like market. Market for yep. antitrust has a very different meaning than market often does in business, but the government will look at your use of the word market and think that it's coextensive with an antitrust definition. So you will often see you know, the antitrust lawyers reviewing it and changing it to marketplace, industry. Segment. I like segment <laughs> yes, a lot. Yes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Sector. Yeah, yeah. Um, moving on, perhaps, to talk about diligence and thinking not just about antitrust, but also areas where companies want to have some regulatory sensitivities. Maybe, Josh, you could talk a little bit about how you see the life cycle of a company and things that you think are important in diligence. Sure. Yes, so I think my remarks can be uh, called uh, begin with the end in mind. Uh, so as a bit of background, uh, one, I'm just talking purely for my own uh, as an individual attorney, not for, my, not for Airbus. Uh, but two, uh, I was an M&A lawyer for a long time, and I had the privilege of working with probably most of the institutions in this room, from Lazar to Wharton to a lot of the, the firms, Sherman and uh, amongst them. Uh, and now I'm on the other side creating companies. So we have this little group in San Jose that's creating advanced aerospace projects. Uh, there, were, there were zero people a year ago, now there's 120, but we have backup from about 140,000 employees in Europe and worldwide. Um, and when, when we try to create a new project, I'm actually thinking of M&A at that moment. Uh, so we're doing deals and we're, we're doing all kinds of things. We may be doing investment deals. We, uh, Ventures is very separate, so Ventures is a legally separate entity as well. So, uh, but we, we do create companies from inception, design idea, to thinking about if we're going to sell it or, or move it on, whether internally or, or with outside partners. And there's three things that we try to do 
so that uh, Jessica's job later on and Steve's job later on is much, much easier. And I would refer to those as training experts in situ and systems. Uh, by training, what I mean is, so I'm not an antitrust lawyer, but I do a lot of antitrust. <laughs> and most of what that is, is putting the fear of God about uh, you know, exclusivity deals and other types of things that could cause problems, uh, whether for general compliance or an M&A compliance, to people on the ground. I, have, I may have an hour to train someone and we're hiring sometimes 10 people a day. So we can't give them a thousand page handbook. That's essentially useless for real life compliance, though may, it may protect lawyers from uh, looking bad later on. So I, what I try to do is I tell them anecdotes about not just Enron and not just FCPA disasters of corruption and things like that, but also Microsoft one, two, and three, right? And if, if for those younger people in the audience, uh, um, you know, it's thinking about issues that DOJ had, had gotten control of and, and, you know, one of the great companies uh, of all time was nearly broken up into two pieces because in part because of conversations that happened uh, over internet browsers in the, in the late 90s. So uh, I was a paralegal on the ground in Virginia uh, in a room of, uh, working on a different project with a thousand Microsoft DOJ paralegals that were coding in all the Microsoft documents. So we've seen that and what my goal is as a chief compliance officer creating companies is to make sure that that would never happen in our team. So we have to educate junior employees, junior engineers, and CEOs, right, of all these things. So imagine you've got seven Elon Muskets or Musks all wanting to create new companies and new aerospace innovations, uh, business or, or technical, uh, and you want to instill that value in them. But they're not going to know how to do it technically in, in real life. So we have, usually we have a product council on site. Uh, I've got, in one case, I've got a Wachtell refugee who's uh, uh, working for us as an outside council and they will be on the ground working with the, the sort of project head or CEO of that entity uh, in real time. And they help us do compliance in real life. And the third thing we have are systems. So not only training documents, but protocols for when you're having a conversation with someone in your vertical or horizontal stack, how do you have that conversation? What's a green light? What's a yellow light? What's a red light? And when do you involve counsel? And usually that's early on. And, and our experts on the ground won't necessarily be antitrust specialists, but they will know enough to spot issues that we can then escalate, uh, either to me or to our outside counsel. Th the reason we have all three of those things is we've seen red flags when we're buying companies for PEs or for strategics, uh, or where we're even doing a debt offering in some cases, right? Where you have really significant risks around the FCPA, uh, F Foreign Corrupt Practices Act, or where you have uh, you know, people trying to spoof sales numbers, right, in the target you're acquiring, privacy issues, cyber issues. Um, so uh, again, by beginning with the end in mind, uh, we try to make life easier down the road for diligence. When we don't see those things, right, as a, a, for me as an acquirer or for me as an M&A lawyer, if I don't see a GC or someone who looks like a GC in a new target, I'm gonna be concerned immediately. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask the question, do they have the institutional person and, and on the ground? Second, do they have the values? Do they care about this? Third, where are they located? Are they, are they from an environment where we can expect a, a potentially higher corruption, anti-corruption risk, corruption risk? Uh, you know, it, it could be harassment issues, right? It could be HR issues, right? That can explode on an M&A. And a lot of times they'll only explode after a big strategic has purchased them. So anyway, that's my perspective and uh, if, if it's helpful. Very helpful and it also in the slide up here makes me think that I should have put for diligence instead of the red X for non-strategic um, a green for the very reasons that Josh was just going into. I was thinking about it more from a perspective of what can business people of the acquirer, potential acquirer see um, in terms of the strategic documents, pricing, HR issues, and for that, you have concerns um, if it's a strategic and not if it is a non-strategic. It's not that the antitrust lawyers are gonna say, oh no, no one at the potential buyer can see this information. We know you need to see it in terms of being able to do valuation, but there are restrictions in that situation about who can see what, it, whether it has to be aggregated up, um, whether it has to be a clean team and their procedures to put in place for that aspect of diligence for strategics. Um, 
Maybe we'll jump very quickly, because I realize we're getting close to getting in between you and lunch, um, to antitrust on the back of one of these cards um, for substantive assessment. Um, I'll quickly do horizontal and then turn it over to Steve to talk sure. about vertical. So horizontal is a little more intuitive, perhaps, than potential vertical concerns. And there, what the government, the statute says, is the transaction in the US, is this transaction likely to lead to a substantial lessening of competition? And that's really done uh, as a question of, is the transaction likely to hurt any identifiable group of customers? Or to the extent you're talking about um, buyer power, is it likely to hurt any identifiable group of sellers, in particular farmers? The government cares a lot about ag deals. And how is that measured? It in practice is measured, is the price likely to go up? Or if the prices were going down, is it likely not to decrease as much as it would have absent the transaction? There's also considerations about the rate of technological innovation um, and service and quality as well. And so there, what the government is primarily assessing is how close a competitor are the two merging parties and what are the realistic alternatives that customers could turn to. In terms of assessing that, the two primary ways that the government does it um, are looking at your the company's documents, both the deal documents that we were talking about earlier that go in with the initial filing, as well as ordinary course documents, because the government has wised up a little bit to the fact that you know, people talk about the importance of document creation and thinking about a deal, and if they are potentially interested in investigating the deal, they will ask for the company's ordinary course strategic documents because they want to see how the companies were analyzing the competitive landscape before they were thinking about this transaction, and maybe us pesky antitrust lawyers started you know, giving some counsel. Um, they will also go out and talk to customers, and they want to hear from customers, what do you think about the transaction? They're not so interested in, oh, I'm really worried that my you know, favorite salesperson is going to lose his job, um, maybe a little bit more so under Trump, but in general not as worried about that as, well, I don't have anybody else to turn to or I played these two guys off of each other and I don't really have a viable alternative um, and I think that my prices are gonna go up. That's what they're really testing. And then in terms of vertical issues. Yeah, I, I think it's worth uh, just two minutes uh, to sort of flag vertical issues. Um, I think uh, you know, this is one of those cases where a little bit of antitrust knowledge can do, can do a lot of harm where somebody uh, thinks, well, if we're not competitors, then I don't need to worry about this. And that's really not the case and I would say for most of Oracle's deal, Oracle's deals, um, potential vertical issues predominate. Um, you know, we we uh, it's a it's a much higher hurdle for us to go out and buy a, a Microsoft or a Salesforce. It hasn't happened yet, um, and I uh, I won't speak to that. But uh, it's you know what much more frequently is a scenario where we're buying something that's uh, in a specific vertical, um, a specific functionality, something that. Uh, goes into Oracle's sort of larger technology stack. And um, those issues, what we're, what we're looking at is some, some, taking some step either up the chain of commerce or down the chain of commerce. Um, I think maybe an easy example is to, um, I'm trying to think of some of the, the sort of uh, high profile vertical deals recently. Um, this is going back a little bit of time, but uh, Google bought ITA, that was a, a a number of years ago, which was one of these travel agents and um, online, uh, not travel agents, but uh, uh, the airline reservation yeah. database, sort of like a saber. Um, and uh, did Google's acquisition of this company, would it give it the ability and incentive, those are the two sort of factors to consider, to foreclose some of its rivals? So not allow, say, a kayak to access this flight database so people can search flights. Um, so, so those are issues that typically don't block deals. Um, I, I don't know, I, 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 in recent decades, his decades, decades, decades yeah. since the government has, has sued on a vertical deal, a ver vertical theory. But it can definitely slow them down and it can result in um, some sort of commitments or consent decree where you're agreeing to provide that product or service, uh, say for a five year term on fair, reasonable and non-discriminatory terms, um, and it can certainly lead to a second request, and it can certainly affect deal timing. So those are issues that are great to know about up front, because the solution to that is making sure that the customers of whatever product are on board, mm -hmm. feel that they have alternatives, and if, you know, if they're feeling a little uncomfortable, 
sort of fixing things in advance and getting them on board that, you know, we're going to take care of you and this isn't something that should raise um, concerns among the agencies and, and slow this deal down. Um, briefly, in terms of integration planning, the reason that's up there is often after parties sign the deal, they think, okay, great, you know, we basically are one company. From the government's perspective, that's not the case, regardless of whether you're a competitor or not. If you're a competitor, the, the basic rule of thumb is until transaction close, you're two separate companies, you need to continue to operate separately. You can still have violations of the antitrust laws until you close. Even if you're not competitors, you still have to worry about something called gun jumping colloquially, and that's basically acting as if you have control, the buyer acting as if they have control or ownership of the target before they've gotten the requisite clearances. The agencies basically don't want you to preempt them. They want their time that they are statutorily entitled to to take a look at the, at the transaction and see whether they have concerns. And the government in the U.S. has sued companies even where the transaction had no substantive issues and closed without any remedies being taken or even a prolonged investigation because um, the buyer has done things that they, the government considers to have given them beneficial ownership before the government had completed its investigation. Um, so it's just something to be conscious of. The safest rule of thumb is to, until the transaction closes, plan, don't implement. With and, and the people, the bane of your existence as an antitrust attorney is, uh, doesn't happen at Oracle, but over-anxious salespeople. Yes. You know, who the second this deal gets announced wants to call up their customer and, and start talking about the future. Um, so that, That's why I think the people on the line have to have that fear of God, right, to, for lack of a better term. In, in, it's the same issue that you talked about a little bit before, Jessica, with the, the data room. Mm -hmm. So when you're doing diligence, again, we, we know there are a lot of deals out there where people are just hunting for, for intel, right, as in information, and the people are trying to grab trade secrets so you really want to have a very structured uh, framework for data sharing, um, not just with whether it's PEs or strategics that are, that are in the, looking to acquire, um, and, but it's when they get access to what and who gets access to what and who's over the wall. So the people I've seen who've done this really well have created a kind of matrix of which information we're going to share when, and you want to avoid that kind of gun jumping stuff. The other place it comes up a lot is transition service disagreements. So you might be sharing services as the seller, right? Especially if it's two strategics, you're, you're giving information and services to the buyer. When does all that happen? There are you know, myriad ways that you can run into antitrust trouble in a transition services agreement if you don't really take a, a really careful line on data control. Oh, we thought we were up. Um, <laughs> questions? Some questions, I think. So. Oh, great. Please. Specifically, what are the kind of thresholds that you hit? Like, if you say, okay, this is really an asset that is suitable for us to, to be considered um, in terms of the transaction, just, you know, because some of the transactions could be so small or, uh, you know, maybe of non physical in nature that could accurately preempt the kind of uh, thresholds. Like, I just want to see any one entry. And can you repeat the question back, if you would? Sorry. Sure. sure. Um, so there are two different aspects to it. One is the government can go after $3 million deals. They have. There was a deal with chickens, involving chickens. The government challenged it, um, $3 million. Um, so there's, in the U.S., there's no line of commerce for them that's too small to be caring about the customers. Um, in terms of sort of the, the is antitrust likely to be an issue here? Are you talking about an area where you may be acquiring or selling to your closest competitor? Are, how many other viable competitors are there out there that customers could realistically turn to on the horizontal way? You know, if you looked at your strap plans or the or, like, how do the business people refer to each other? Are they saying this is the thorn in my side? I can't wait to get rid of them. They are keeping my prices down. That's pretty good in red flag for you that there may be some antitrust issues with that. In terms of the vertical issues, are you talking about a situation where there's only one or two suppliers out there, um, or are there a whole host? Um, those, again, sort of the idea of even if you wanted to shut out your competitors, are you really going to be able to? If there are six other suppliers out there, you're not realistically going to be able to, and you're not likely to have an antitrust concern. If you're talking about buying one or two or a critical one, 
you may be, and you should give um, further thought to antitrust considerations. Just to echo that, one of the things that you have to be aware of is that the DOJ or whoever the enforcer is, right, it could be uh, China or the EU, they're not just looking at the, the magnitude of the deal, although that's very important empirically to what they enforce, because the, you're in the Wall Street Journal and they're gonna, they're gonna perk up when they read it. Uh, you can trigger M&A or other deal antitrust liability just from a conversation, right? If that's deemed to be a conspiracy to suppress commerce, right? If you're price fixing or if, it, if there's a theory that you're price fixing, that can trigger a theoretical liability. And I think in most cases, there's ways to do deals on those small magnitudes without, without triggering it. The problem is it happens inadvertently. People stumble into this stuff and then someone in an acquisition, like it, it may not be in an M&A originally, it might be that, oh, originally we had this great deal where we were sharing advertising intel with Google and with Yahoo and with Microsoft and four other people, and then they're, they're gonna get acquired. And the acquirer looks at them and says, no, no deal, we're out. Because as soon as it goes to M&A, that tiny little deal that was helpful to you becomes an antitrust liability. So the, the worry, even though it might be theoretical for smaller deals, you want to make sure that your team is and the and the, the company is is thinking about this stuff and and being being uh, compliant. And just sort of on a sort of broad look at thresholds, what sort of thresholds mm -hmm. um, people look at. I think there is a sometimes reductionist um, thought process regarding market shares, um, which there's some that are pretty obviously a problem. You know, if it's there's three people in a market and you're going down to two and you know, 30 and 30%, 60, you know, we can all do that sort of math. Look at the pie charts. I, I like to think of antitrust attorneys as pie chart experts. Um, <laughs> but uh, the, that's not the whole story though. And you can have two relatively small market shares where there's something unique, mm -hmm. where there's some unique characteristics about how you compete, which creates an antitrust issue. Um, one example we were talking about recently, which these are two large companies and had large market share, um, was the uh, Office Depot Staples deal, which just got blocked, the, the government sued to block and was successful, um, helped along by the fact that uh, the, uh, the, the defense attorneys there didn't present a, uh, a defense of the case. But, um, uh, you know, it's judgment calls. But um, literally just rested the case without doing any sort of defense whatsoever. Um, but uh, it's, the theory in that case was there's a unique, market or sub-market, however you want to define it, um, for large national companies. So uh, yeah, you, if you, there was precedent there regarding the previous deal where uh, Office Depot bought Office Max, um, where, uh, okay, you can buy your pens, staplers, staples online. Amazon sort of remedies all these competition concerns. That was true in the retail setting, but what the government argued there was that there are these national um, companies that you know need office supply needs. Company like Oracle, um, where there's unique characteristics of competition. You have to have you know same day delivery. You have to have be able to get these supplies to offices all over the country in a short period of time, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and in that sort of specific bidding information, there were basically the two companies that showed up again and again and again. Um, so be be aware of those issues. And we didn't get into the practicalities here, but being conscious of those issues and thinking about it in terms of your deal contract and have it a little bit in the presentation that are in the materials is something that's important because oftentimes what a seller will want the buyer to agree to is what's commonly known as a hell or high water. Basically, the buyer will do whatever it takes to get the antitrust approval. But sometimes there are transactions where the government says there's nothing you can do to fix this transaction. So even though the seller has offered to do, or sorry, the buyer has offered to do a hell or high water, the government says, no, it's not a fixable transaction. The AT&T, T-Mobile. Um, Staples the, office. Staples they they had some the, regional player that exactly. they were, were going to divest a bunch yep. of, and it, they just said it wouldn't. And, and the Cisco US Food Service one yeah. as well. Um, so in terms of the deal certainty, that's an aspect to think about for the seller as well. Is your deal fixable? Yeah. And, and on, the, on the company, t uh, the acquiree side, Sometimes you want to say no to these things. We say no to stuff all the time if we think there's a there's some kind of a hidden risk like that. Any other questions? So where is the regulatory environment going now with uh, basically knocking the red line? It, Obviously, likely be a little bit more pragmatic. 
a little bit industry favorable. That I think that is what everybody is expecting. I mean, so the the common answer right after Trump was elected, you know, was hmm, who knows what's going to happen, right? I I think a little bit more nuanced than that. The expectation is, by and large, you'll go back to a more traditional conservative um, Republican approach to antitrust enforcement, which tends to be more concerned about over enforcement errors and thinking that markets are more self-correcting than perhaps the Obama administration had done so. Also probably more of a willingness to engage in remedies. Um, so there were a number of large transactions where parties had offered up remedies along the lines discussed, you know, offering up to do set up a regional player um, where the Obama administration government said no. Um, we don't think that's sufficient to remedy the concerns and probably see a little bit more willingness to engage um, in those now. And Macon is a former Bush administration DOJ official as well. And I think is, you know, his confirmation hearing, I think he had very few questions and not just because of the FBI issue that was out there yesterday. But, um, you know, I think that people think that he will get approved um, and, you know, be fairly hands off. Um, and that Trump likely is to be too, but you know, he's maybe interested in a few things, right? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Although Macon has been on record, you know, I think it was in October or November saying he didn't think that there were issues with that. There may be some vertical issues actually with that transaction, um, but probably not to get it blocked. I think there was one more question. Was it a similar vein? Okay. I think healthcare is in the spotlight, media is in the spotlight, but in, they, in fairness, healthcare is always. I was going to say, I was going to say they're the both. They were in the spotlight yeah, before, yeah. so I, you know, I, I don't know that it's all that different for that. It's a, it's a good question. It's uh, it's time for lunch, <laughs> <laughs> so let's have lunch together, and we'll continue the conversation. The doors down here are the way to lunch, so. Please thank the panelists and, and, uh, and Jessica for the good conversation. Thank you. Thanks for